Good afternoon. Thank you all for showing up this afternoon. Uh, I'm David Davis, Interim Associate Dean of Arts and Humanities. I'm beginning to think that Interim is my middle name. So uh, on behalf of Millsaps and particularly our division, I want to welcome you to our celebration of the Humanities Teacher of the Year Award. Thanks to the Mississippi Humanities Council for their support over the many years that have allowed us to acknowledge and uh, congratulate uh, faculty in our division. The representative today is one of our own. Um, Evan Jones, class of 2020, is back to present an award to Kristen. Thank you. Um, I'll try not to take up too much of Dr. Golden's time as she is the highlight of the day. And I'll say that um, ever since I took over this program, the Humanities Teacher of the Year program, I had this sneaking feeling that if I could make my way back to Millsaps, I'd try my hardest and uh, managed to make that happen. Um, so I'm really excited to be back. And I'll tell you also that this, sometimes these speeches are difficult as I don't often know these places that I'm going to. I don't often know the professors and the students um, at these institutions that I'm going to. And here it's easy. I may not have had you personally, Dr. Golden, but I've heard such great stories that I feel with the utmost confidence that you are the most deserving person for this award. And um, there's no one more deserving of getting it also on the Humanities Council's 50th anniversary, where we are trying hardest to find people who truly represent the unique stories diversity and culture that we have within our state. So without further ado, I'd like to present you with your award and listen to your lecture. I do want to acknowledge uh, and, and to thank uh, our provost Keith Dunn and our president who's here as well for their support and the continued support for the arts and humanities at Millsaps. You're in one of the new facilities that came as a result of that. We've had the position that have been filled because of their willingness to think about ways to uh, the uh, arts and humanities in our community. And I would like to invite Dr. Dunn to come forward and introduce the Teacher of the Year. Thank you. It's great to see you all. Welcome to the McMullen Lecture Hall in the uh, McRae Christian Center. And also welcome to those folks who've joined us uh, via YouTube. This is one of the great highlights of the year. Uh, it's one of those can't miss things and I'm, I'm very, look, very much looking forward uh, to Kristen's talk today. Dr. Kristen Brown Golden joined the Millsaps faculty in 1995 after completing a PhD in philosophy at Vanderbilt University and a BA in history from Stanford University. Dr. Golden also studied at the Free University of Berlin in Germany. She continued, she currently serves as both the chair of the philosophy department and the director of the Peace and Justice Studies program at Millsaps. In 2015, Dr. Golden was awarded a National Endowment for the Humanities Enduring Questions Grant to create a course on the question, <clears throat> is peace possible? Dr. Golden is a great example of a faculty member who utilizes her excellent academic expertise and her professional practice to better understand and improve upon the human condition. Please help me welcome my colleague and Millsaps 2021-22 Mississippi Humanities Council Humanities Teacher Award winner, Dr. Kristen Brown Golden. Kristen. Thank you, Provost Dunn and the Mississippi Humanities Council for this opportunity to share my ideas. Um, I also want to thank Kennedy, Nicholas, Suzette Jennings, David Davis, Michael Stamey, and Scott McNamee, uh, and Evan Jones uh, for all their help. About 10 years ago, I decided to have my research turn in a new direction, to have philosophy of race integral to it. 
I wanted to learn more about how racism and racial bias form and how they can dissipate and how the experience of racial bias is similar or different for white versus black people or for me versus other people. Am I alone in how I experience my racial bias? Do others experience racial bias internally, even if they try not to express it? And are they consciously troubled by it? To narrow the focus, this talk focuses on white racial bias and combines neuroscience and Freud. And it addresses three areas. A link between automatic race bias and the amygdala, and the amygdala, as you know, is part of the limbic system, part of the brain that registers threat. Freud's concept of displaced affect or feeling. And third, a connection between some American white people's self-reported egalitarianism and suppressed prejudice. And my thesis. More white people can embrace a principle of social fairness if ways many of us live or deny our racial bias is made clearer to people. And comparing neuroscience and Freud can help here. So I want to start with an image of the mind that's from Plato. It's from his dialogue, Phaedrus. And if you look at the history of philosophy, or even many uh, contemporary psychologists, you'll notice that they often divide the mind into two or three parts. And though they will differ in a lot of the details of those parts, generally there is uh, the general sense that there is a rational part, an irrational part, maybe a third part. In the case of Plato, um, this image, he gives the image um, to show three parts to the mind. The charioteer is the rational part of the mind. And the two horses, one of them is not rational, but it can obey the rational mind. And the other one is irrational. And it doesn't want to obey the rational mind. It's not very good at it. And in, in this particular dialogue, um, Plato considers it this part of our mind to have a madness. So I'm talking about the mind, uh, especially of white people in 21st century America. And this is a mind that has been shaped by 350 years of slavery and Jim Crow. And we're like six decades um, beyond explicit embrace of those things, so not very long. What kind of irrationality is happening uh, in um, the American psyche today? So I'm going to start with the neuroscience part of the talk. Contemporary psychologists use the term non-conscious to mean mental processes not mediated by consciousness. One body of studies that I looked at highlights inconsistency between people's conscious racial beliefs and their non-conscious race-biased beliefs. Elizabeth Phelps, her work in 2000, and Phelps and Mazarin Banaji collaborating in 2006, confirm and build upon early stages of Phelps' body of research. And they're very important um, in racial bias neuroscience. In their work, the white subjects tested, this is like an early phase of this research, again, in the early 2000, like you know, 2005, 2006. Um, in their work, the white subjects tested tended to consciously affirm belief in equality, but non-consciously prefer their in-group, which is to say whites. The black persons tested in a companion study, by contrast, explicitly affirmed, unlike the whites, a preference for their racial group. But unconsciously, they registered a lower in-group preference than white people did. The studies suggest that both groups' conscious avowals are masking complicating competing feelings. <laughs> 
In other experiments during the same period, Phelps and Banaji did an assessment that connects the force of non-conscious thoughts influencing racially biased behavior to the amygdala. So remember, the amygdala is part of the limbic system and it registers threat. There have been a lot of implicit racial bias studies and tests done since these early ones, millions of them. Um, but I'm, I'm basing my talk on this early work, which is um, indicative of what comes later. So in other experiments during the same period, Phelps and Banaji did an assessment that connects, oh, oops, sorry, I, I read that part. So the pivotal experiments by Phelps in 2000 and works by Phelps and Banaji in 2006 included four components. The first component was an fMRI, a functional magnetic resonance imaging of the amygdala, while participants looked at photos of unfamiliar black male faces or unfamiliar white male faces. And the idea was to test for conditioned fear. So the fMRI measures increases and decrease, decreases in blood flow to the brain um, to measure the extent of conditioned fear here. And so they compared the results of the fMRI to two implicit behavioral tests and one explicit behavioral test. Okay, so in psychology, implicit basically means non-conscious and explicit basically means conscious. One of the implicit behavioral tests was a startle eye blink assessment, and I'll come back to that shortly. The explicit test used the modern racism scale. So what that does is it registers hidden conscious racism. So for instance, you answer questions such as, over the past few years, blacks have gotten more economically than they deserve, and then you there's a scale, um, strongly disagree, uh, moderately agree, you know, like maybe six different gradients, strongly agree. And so that measures um, hidden conscious racism in people. The fourth component of these four tests that they look at together, Phelps and Banaji, is an impl implicit association test. So I want to say a little bit about an implicit association tests, or IATs. They're a quick way of, of measuring non-conscious bias, but the underlying construct of the tests is not the same thing as the underlying construct of non-conscious bias. So the idea is that the mind can sort two concepts more quickly if it associates them closely. So if I say girl and ask you to finish this word on the screen, you'll think boy quicker than soy. And if I say happy and ask you to complete this word, you'll say sad quicker than fad. So how does this relate to the IAT Phelps and Banaji used? Their IAT asked individuals to sort four kinds of items. Photos of unfamiliar black male faces with neutral expressions, photos of, of unfamiliar white male faces with neutral expressions, words with positive connotations like love, joy, friendship, or words with negative connotations like agony, devil, vomit. Okay, so four items that people are to sort, but they only had two keypads that they could use to sort the four types. So for the first half of their testing, one of the keypad had the word, keypads has the word white, and it also has the word bad. And the other keypad has the word black or the, and the word good. And for the second half of the test, the keys are conversely arranged. Black, bad, white, good. 
The difference in time using one keypad system, white or bad, black or good, as opposed to the other, black or bad, white or good, measures implicit racial bias or stereotype bias um, in this case. Okay, so the functional magnetic resonance imaging data on white Americans you know, regarding the amygdala for this test, it showed greater amygdala activation with unfamiliar black faces. Though there was enough variability that results were insignificant, results of subsequent studies using the same format would show significance. But the important idea in this early round of testing for Phelps and Banaji, however, is the relationship among the amygdala activation and the three additional tests for implicit and explicit bias. In other words, when considered together, the test of implicit race bias, explicit race bias, and amygdalic movement were significant. The subjects who startled more with the neutral black faces tended to have a higher anti-black bias on the modern racism scale. And in the startle eye blink tests, participants were exposed to a loud noise at the same time as they looked at pictures of unfamiliar black male or white male faces. Phelps and Banaji write, quote, the difference in the strength of the startle eye blank response while viewing black versus white faces was the measure of race bias, end quote. Subjects measuring higher in anti-black bias on the modern racism scale measured higher in the amygdala response. When viewed along a study of black Americans who showed greater amygdala activation in response to white, un white unfamiliar male faces than to black unfamiliar male faces, the group data about race bias suggests non-conscious bias against outgroup faces in general. Combining the startle eye blank I IAT with the additional implicit and explicit tests and comparing them with functional imaging measuring, measuring the strength of activity of individuals amygdala, Phelps and Banaji's study seems to link non-conscious race bias signaled by the association testing to activation of the amygdala. The amygdalic activity Phelps and Banaji measured, quote, reflects an immediate implied threat response to racial outgroup members, end quote. Together, the four studies correlated in Phelps and Banaji's analysis are significant in showing race-specific in-group preferencing. The tests provide data that social evaluation of outgroup races occurs non-consciously and predictably along race group lines. And whites showing more negativity towards blacks and blacks showing more negativity to whites, but to a lesser degree. This in-group preferencing is not inevitable. It's a historical situation that's built upon th the 350 years of slavery and Jim Crow that have dominated most of America's history. So over two decades of IAT testing, we have learned, and this, this comes from the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Office of UCLA, uh, University of California, Los Angeles. Um, we've learned that 76% associate women with family as opposed to career. 72% associate Excuse me, um, wait, let me start over. I got that, that wrong. 61% uh, associate Asians with foreign as opposed to American. 76% associate women with family as opposed to career. 72% associate blacks with weapons as opposed to harmless objects. Many of you, um, depending on your age, may have heard of Amadou Diallo. Amadou Diallo, in 1999, uh, was returning from work to the Bronx. He lived on a street called Wheeler Street, and he had finished his work 
at his stall where he stole, sold sweaters, CDs, candy bars, gloves. It was February. It was cold. And he returned to his apartment, which he shared with three roommates. He chatted with them some. And then he decided to go down to his stoop and take in the night air. It was a clear night. It was crisp. At about the same time, it was about midnight, a Ford Taurus, an unmarked car holding four uh, policemen in plain clothes, wearing baseball caps, jeans, and sweatshirts, uh, which bulged over bulletproof vests, rounded the corner onto the same street that, that Diallo stood on. They're part of a, a, a kind of crime unit that has since been disbanded. And it was called the street crime unit. And they would go to poor neighborhoods believed to be quote unquote hot spots. And they were looking for several suspects who they thought lived maybe in this area. And they saw Diallo. Hey, do you see that guy on the porch? Why is he just standing there? What could he possibly be doing, one of them said. He can't possibly be up to any good, says another. And they imagine that he could be one of their suspects. Two of the cops, Sean Carroll and Edward McMillan, climb out of the car and they begin to approach Diallo, saying, hey, police. And they hold up their badges. Can we have a word with you? Now Diallo, he lisped. He didn't know English really well. He was from West Africa. Um, he was 23 years old, and two white guys in baseball caps and street clothes puffed up with the gear they had underneath was probably very intimidating. He spooked and he bolted into the vestibule. They followed him, and Diallo, as he, he ran up, the, there were stairs inside the vestibule that, that connected to another door into the apartment building, which needed a, a sort of key. So the officers were partly up the stairs, yelling at him to keep his hands out of his pockets. And Diallo has, has his left hand on the door and his right hand fumbling in his pocket. And they see something dark and square that Diallo has pulled out of his pocket and is extending towards him. And Officer Car Carroll, he yells, gun, gun. And he opens fire. And in the mayhem, McMillan opens fire. And Diallo begins crouching in the corner to make himself very small. And he's still extending his right arm. And the bullets are ricocheting. The officers assume many are coming from Diallo. A third officer, Ken Boos, comes to assist and begins shooting. And between them, they shot 41 bullets. When it was clear Amadou Diallo was not a threat, they climbed the stairs to look for his gun. Amadou's hand clutched a small black object, but it was not a gun. He'd been trying to give them his wallet. Carol breaks down in tears. And when the ambulance arrives, Boss had practically gotten lost walking around the street, distraught, and he can't speak. The pain of these officers is not very important compared to the pain of Diallo's family. But I want to focus on it as an example of the irrationality that, has, that constitutes um, many of our brains in the United States, the damage from um, so many decades of a slave and Jim Crow culture. So Phelps and Benaji interpret the, the group-specific tendencies of race bias dissociation to be, quote, reflections of learning within a specific culture. Virtually universal to human existence is being part of a social group. And if one is a member of a social group, quote, it's impossible to avoid acquiring evaluations of social groups. That is to say, it's impossible to avoid being influenced by an evaluation. Quote, 
uh, excuse me, yeah. Um, so it's impossible to avoid being influenced by the spoken and unspoken, spoken and unspoken messages of the social group. But being influenced by an evaluation does not require its conscious endorsement. Investigating the amygdala activity connecting to non-conscious racial bias of whites against blacks helps because it can show trends among large numbers of individuals across groups. It's satisfying to some research researchers because it's tied to a particular bodily organ, the amygdala, makes it appear less ambiguous. But unlike the neural experiments, certain Freud concepts can provide more specific reasons why the neuroscience results become what they are. So um, the concept suppression versus repression. So I want to talk a little bit about Freud now. Suppressed ideas, that notion of suppressed ideas, this corresponds to Freud's notion of the pre-conscious. Um, and he sometimes calls this the weak unconscious. It corresponds to ideas um, that are, we're just not thinking consciously about at the moment. Um, at least the weak unconscious does. Suppressed ideas are ideas which are strongly resisted in the weak unconscious. For instance, uh, denied ideas, disavowed ideas. But what's different about suppressed ideas as opposed to repressed ideas is that they're accessible to consciousness. 
Freud, but she doesn't explain whether um, for white privilegists, the, um, the sense of the betterness of whiteness is unconscious in a, in a weak sense, suppressed, or unconscious in a strong sense, repressed. And so that is what's important to me, trying to figure that out. Not only can many white Americans regularly be unaware of ways we condone white privilege, we're often unaware of our membership in a racial group, writes Sullivan, and that, and that the group positions its privilege to the advantage of people of color. How can many white people be unaware of their group membership, Sullivan asks, when membership requires felt emotional connections to the group and its leading idea? How can white privilegists enjoy a felt connection to their group, Sullivan asks, but not realize they are avid members of the group? White privilegists cognitively reject racism. They may affirm a supposed colorblind society, or they may be su suspicious of how their anti-racism ideals almost assuredly conflict with a damaged mentality, a mentality with suppressed beliefs about white superiority that their anti-racism views consciously disavow. So the first concept of Freud that I wanted to introduce to you, I have introduced to you, and it's the idea of the leading idea, uh, especially applied to the idea of white sup superiority. Is it unconscious? Uh, for white privileges or in the weak sense or the strong sense. The second key Freud concept is the concept of displacement. Freud's idea of displacement helps answer the question, how is it that many white people are unaware they affirm membership in their group and that, and that they do so, do so because they believe it to be better or advantaged? Freud says we have these idea affects, in other words, these sort of embodied composites that also have a representing idea. You've got the idea and you've got the, the, the feeling tone. Those are the two parts of the composite. He said, we, ha we, we have these. And the affect, the feeling part, is represented by the idea part, which can be a memory context. And Freud suggests these idea affect composites can break apart. They can break into two, into the idea and the bodily symptom or, or, the, or the feeling tone. And in his 1915 essay, The Unconscious, Freud writes, quote, ideas can become unconscious but not the feeling part, not the affects." End quote. Most significant for my purposes in the story of Freud's affect, or these composite idea affects, is this. If an affects correlate idea becomes repressed, the affect becomes displaced. It becomes misunderstood. released, the affect or the bodily symptom attaches to another idea more neutral to the ego. So, and I'm quoting from Freud now. Owing to the repression, this is on the screen, owing to the repression of its proper ideational representative, it has been forced, in other words, the affect, to become connected with another idea and is now regarded by consciousness as the manifestation of that idea, end quote. The most shunned ideas move to the unconscious becoming repressed, lost, and unknowable. So in this slide, on the screen, I want you to ignore the words ego, superego, and id, even though they're bright. And I have the slide up here to show that displacement at the level of the weak unconscious, or weak unconsciousness, which Freud calls the preconscious, 
is higher up on the iceberg. It's below the water because it's not being thought about at the moment, uh, but it's, it's not technically repressed, the ideas here. Um, displacement at the level of the unconscious is very deep and under the water. I agree with Shannon Sullivan that when a feeling or its ideational representative becomes morally or socially unacceptable, a less painful emotion or idea often replaces it. And this can happen in cases of whites elevating their racial group above other racial groups. These idea affect composites that are racially charged negatively or positively, for instance, dislike of or discomfort among black people, combined with reverence and affection for white people, is prejudice. For decades, pressures of moral standards have made it hard for individuals to acknowledge a racially biased feeling. And so, as Freud's displacement theory suggests, the idea-affect pairing can separate. And even if the idea does not become part of the strong unconscious, it can become separated, separated from the affect nevertheless. And when this happens, the affect or emotion is misinterpreted as another emotion, more acceptable to the ego. Maybe even love of all people, rather than hatred for a kind of um, labeled people. So, and an example of this, I think, is the All Lives Matter movement. So, a reminder of what the All Lives Matter movement is. To understand it, one needs to be reminded of the Black Lives Movement, uh, Black Lives Matter movement, its or origination. And that was in 2013, after the, acqu the acquittal of the murderer of Trayvon Martin. By 2015, uh, during the presidential election, the All Lives Matter movement was well underway, and it was a reaction to the Black Lives Matter movement. It basically, it basically denied the concept of Black Lives Matter, which was that there is an enormous disproportion of racially motivated violence suffered by black people. So All Lives Matter basically said all lives matter. In other words, it just dismissed the idea of any difference in proportion of suffering or racialized violence. So uh, candidates that embraced the All Lives Matter movement, Rand Paul, Ben Carson, Donald Trump, all aligned, uh, all rejected Black Lives Matter. Talk show host Glenn Beck planned an All Lives Matter march in Birmingham, Alabama in 2015. The rejection of Black Lives Matter by some politicians and organizations, as you know, energized the alt-right white supremacist extremists. And my focus is on, however, All Lives Matter kinds of people who are not extremists, but white privilegists. They would probably, or many of them, identify as colorblind, I think. In other words, I don't see race. Mottos for them might be, be kind and caring, be fair, remember the golden rule, treat others the way you want to be treated. But on this view, with these mottos, egalitarianism becomes a su substitute for acknowledging white advantage and structural racism. Many white individuals do not consciously consider that their emotional tie to white people may be in part to white people as white people. Many white people, by and large, seem unwilling to accept that emotional ties may presuppose not only the, the comfort of in-group belonging, but a tacit allegiance to the leading idea of white, of white privilege and to the comforts of white privilege. <clears throat> 
The most white people resist, con resist conscious racism or thinking of themselves of, as being racists. It seems that many white Americans harbor nevertheless the belief that white people are preferable to or better than many black people. The belief seems visible in a set of habits comfortable with and de facto supporting white advantage. If the belief of white superiority is highly resisted in white privilegists' um, conscious attitudes, it seems right to say it's not so resisted as to be part of what Freud called the unconscious. So I, I'm, I have determined, and it took me a long time to determine this, that, um, that, that the, the idea of the, the, the supposed betterness of white people that becomes repressed among many white people, or excuse me, suppressed among many white people is suppression, not repression on Freud's terms. And that's because you follow what I'm saying here. You utterly follow it. And if it were repressed, you would be utterly surprised and not really following these ideas because repression suggests something that is so, um, so uh, reviled, so disconnected from one that one doesn't have access to it consciously for Freud. White privilegists pervasive an awareness of our membership in a racial group we may partly sub support because of its perceived superiority or advantage, I am arguing, is not unconscious in the strong sense Freud cares about, but it's non-conscious in a way post-Freudians care about. OK, so what does it all mean? Brewing itself into the non-conscious area of the central nervous system and organizing virtually every aspect of American society, white privilege characterizes a decisive order in many white Americans' psychic and civic racializing structures. The neuroscience shows how widespread the race bias is. The Freud concepts of leading idea and affect displacement applied to white racial group membership after the civil rights movement help to explain a couple of things. How is it that self-affirmed self colorblind people can be mistaken about their, their complicity in white privilegism? And how whites who reject colorblindness can regularly ignore complicity in white domination? Freud's thought and the groundwork laid by Phelps and Panagi relate to each other on significant points. The idea from Freud that misunderstood displaced beliefs or regularly, or regularly resisted emotionally upsetting beliefs are widespread for people. The idea that they are willfully disregarded but not unconscious in the sense Freud means is consistent with prevailing neuroscience. Combined, the psychotherapeutic and neuroscientific approaches can provide a more variegated and complex narrative of white racial bias and domination in the United States. So I want to say a little bit about uh, neural duality as it relates to understanding race bias. In other words, two bases in the brain uh, for race bias. Uh, one of them, one of these neural systems grounds racial prejudice. Um, the amygdala, the orbital frontal cortex, uh, the insula, the striatum, uh, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, this area of the brain is a system for processing prejudiced affect, which is a more um, ingrained uh, kind of prejudice. It's deeper, it's felt, uh, and, of course, and it's non-conscious. A second brain base uh, for understanding race bias, um, this is more cognitive. It's uh, more, it grounds stereotyping. It's less deep, uh, but of course still uh, terribly important. It's the lateral and, and anterior temporal lobes, the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, the inferior frontal gyrus. They constitute the processing, processing center for racial stereotyping. Um, and 
these ideas and these images come from David Amodio, uh, his Nature article, 2014. It's an article in the magazine Nature. So the, the two brain systems seem to operate in concert. They facilitate non-conscious race bias that can be felt and cognitive, expressed and unexpressed. And what this amounts to um, are difficulties. Our brains can be malleable, but there are, there are difficulties. So intentionally undoing or attempting to intentionally undo the developments in one brain base, let alone both, though super desirable, will be hard to do on a broad scale without simultaneous transformations in societal structures that would be capable of reinforcing the dissolving of embodied racial bias. So one reason why is the formation of white racially biased habits, if partially dependent on conscious thinking, also happens through non-conscious neural processing. The, ba uh, the, bases, uh, uh, the two neural bases absorb environmental cues which regularly exceed individual awareness. Much, but not all, of our environment is still sending race-biased messages. It's a tough battle, but it's not impossible for some people. It seems unlikely to happen on a broad scale, though, unless societal structures change. So what's a constructive path? Well, reducing expression of implicit bias appears to be totally possible, thus reducing some of prejudice's harmful com consequences. Black and white people working on common goals has been shown to override racial in-group bias. And from Jerry King at the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Office of, of UCLA, um, he, he encourages, be humble, be humble. If you, if you assume that you are objective, that you are fair and beyond stereotype bias, you are probably wrong. So be mindful. Our implicit biases are most often expressed when emotions are high or we're in a hurry. Slowing down helps. Being mindful helps. Practice counter-messaging. This is still coming from Jerry Kang of UCLA. If you notice you've stereotyped somebody, pause. Label it as such. Reflect on the conditions in which your stereotype emerged. And then take time to counter message to yourself. In other words, think of a counter stereotype. In fact, think of several. Doing this can help proliferate anti-racial bias beliefs in the non-conscious mind because the, the, the struggle for um, people who at least consciously reject racism is in the non-conscious where there are beliefs that are racist and beliefs that are anti-racist. And they're, depending on the preponderance in one's non-conscious, it's going to really affect your behaviors. OK, so, so now to the simple topic of critical race theory. Now, actually, to the simple topic of societal structures of racism, ha, huh, that's not simple either. Even when an individual succeeds in squashing pre prejudicial behaviors when identified piecemeal, unacknowledged and denied commitments to white privilege can remain. Without a parallel dismantling of societal structures of racism, most white and black individuals, it seems, will be unable to undo some or much of their race bias brain developments. But undoing anti-black or anti-white racial bias is a partial goal in the schema. 
The major goal is structural justice. A place to start, I believe, is becoming clear about white domination, which is to say about the prevalence of white racial bias and the system of structures advantaging white people. Many white individuals need more knowledge about complex defenses protecting the ego from the unacceptable truism that one probably is a white privilegist, implicitly affirming the betterness of whiteness, if only for its advantages. Surely more white people can be cultivated to become more conscious of the unfair benefits of their racialized group. This conscious choice could do a little to dislodge automatic startles among cops as work to improve societal structures continues. Think of Philando Castile, who in 2016, in a suburb of Minneapolis, is pulled over by a cop for a taillight that was busted. And in the process of reaching for his license and registration, which the cop asked him to do, the cop shot him. Think of Stefan Clark in 2018 in Sacramento, who was evading two officers on foot, ran into his grandmother's black backyard, and the two officers began gaining, gaining on him again, and one thinks he sees Stefan holding a gun, and both shoot him, but there was no gun. Stefan Clark held a cell phone. Whites, especially colorblind whites, becoming more conscious of and rejecting their unfair privileges could make a difference in public policy. It would be a step toward diminishing the system of racism that roots the startles and many other evils. The goal is not psychology of fairness in the white psyche per se. The goal is dissolving racism, the majority of which is structural. Dismantling white domination depends on white people and people of color communicating, designing, and supporting policy that recalibrates advantages and structural justice. White people will be more able to recognize, adopt, and accomplish a principle of social fairness if the, if the pervasiveness of white racism, racial bias, and forms of denial by, white, by whites is made clearer to people. The clarifying can be helped with insights from Freud and neuroscience. And uh, thank you. That concludes the formal part of the talk. Uh, so um, actually, Questions? yes, that would be wonderful. And I would like to invite Kennedy Nicholas, who I'm so grateful, who's going to field any streaming questions that we have to come on up. Michael, can you remind me how to turn the audience mics on? <laughs> the questions from the audience. Right. We don't have those on. <coughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kristen. This is a really important talk, a really important topic for us all to be thinking about. And one of the things that scares me most right now is the way in which various implicit, hidden, suppressed, repressed, I'm not being specific about my language here, but ways in which people felt hesitant to speak out certain deeply felt feelings and were in fact living a life that, where they were gradually um, becoming less racialized and because they were not able to articulate out loud and in public some of their racial prejudices. Now that it's gone, uh, I think in the last six, seven years, that the lid has come off of Pandora's box, so to speak. And 
too many people feel free to express publicly ideas that they were, they used to feel were not acceptable, and now they feel are acceptable, at least to a, to a overly sizable part of the American population. Do you have any ideas about, uh, this is of course a totally unfair question, but I'm just curious if you have any ideas about how to put the lid back on the Pandora's box? You know? <laughs> actually can't touch such people until they're ready to listen. Um, so, but I'm thinking, so those would be uh, alt-right supremacists. And I, I, I haven't thought enough about how to do that. I've tried really hard to think about what I just talked about. <laughs> So I'm sorry, but maybe um, do you have any ideas that you can share with us? There's maybe somebody from the audience who has thought more about that. I suppose I'm, I'm not as worried about the alt-right supremacists. They're going to spew whatever it is they want to. I'm, I'm more concerned about the people that sit in a public setting like this at a school, a town hall or a school board meeting and will say anything and feel very, have the right to do that. And yet it's hurtful to every, to people in the room. There's no, there's, there seems to be no control at, at a level at what I would call the norm of civic engagement as opposed to the alt-right. I, I don't know. Just, that, that concerns me as much as anything. Without regard for other people in the, in that same space. So are you thinking that um, these are people that maybe would be um, sort of colorblind white supremacists, or sorry, white privilegists, who nonetheless identify and take some pride in sort of callous statements that protect their in-group? Well, and their catchphrases that, that, that will be used that imply the repression. In other right. words, they're talking about something but they're really talking about something. Right, right. So yeah, so so I talked about um, the All Lives Matter movement, but we could talk about critical race theory, which to me is sort of the new way of um, sort of sort of the idea of banning critical race theory is a way. At least people who are leaders in that political leaders, I see it just basically as a way of strategizing to maintain and grab more power. Um, it's not about ideals, it's about power. And to the extent that they can use lessons from uh, the playbook of Jim Crow, they will. Um, and the followers just are following. They don't necessarily know exactly what they're following, I think. Um. So, so much of it is, is, goes back to coded language, you know, so, so somebody says um, critical race theory, I mean, that's, that's like saying all lives matter, so that becomes like another one of those just catchphrases that, that people that use it more often than not don't understand what it is. I want to say that you know, uh, in, in Jackson there have been ongoing efforts since the uh, since the civil rights movement, of course. But uh, these ideas of reconciliation that often come up within churches, uh, churches that strive to be uh, more churchy, you know, more, 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 more Christ-like, I would say in terms of acceptance and being able to say, this is a, you know, we need to, let's sit down and talk about 
issues and come to some things that we can agree about, about, the, about the past, the present, and how we move into the future. So reconciliation is just important to continue to try to do rather than rather than divide, reconcile and find common. So I might characterize myself as an overly optimistic pragmatist. Um, and in that regard, I tend to think like, oh, did, did you need to respond to that? No, that's my <laughs> um, I might, um, I, I might cling to the hope that required implicit bias training throughout the, uh, the community will lead to real progress in identifying. But I, I find that tough to butt up against the idea of the distinction between suppression and recession and realize if I'm interpreting what your thoughts are correctly that perhaps the people that might benefit most from implicit bias training are the least likely to benefit from it because of the level of um, repression of the ideas that cause the implicit bias. Am I, am I thinking along the right lines or have I gotten lost somewhere? Um. So, no, I think, I, I think you are thinking along the right lines. Um, people who, I think people who are colorblind, uh, who, who think they are colorblind and embrace, embrace a colorblind attitude are less likely to examine themselves. However, what they all want is to believe that they are good. They want to think that they are good. They believe that they, and to be good, you have to be not racist. I am not racist. Colorblind white privileges believe I am good, I am not racist. So may, my approach would be, um, how do we, how does it get communicated that the colorblind theory is not fair? That it's, that it's ahistorical, that it's not tapping into real lives of people in the history of our nation, um, that it's assuming that we're sort of disembodied individuals and we all are just brains and we all should be treated, can be treated fairly and are treating each other fairly and that's just not the case. <laughs> several examples of police shootings also. Here you've got um, people in positions of power who supposedly are, 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 should, are, are, should have been trained with these kinds of, of concepts of how to do community policing or, or at least have a, a, a better understanding of, of, of the other, of those not like them. But we have situations like this, and we have we have members of the community that, when they see a policeman, policeman, their amygdala is going, "Wow!" You know, so uh, and, and it's understandable given, given the situations that that uh, Dr. Golden is talking about that there's a distrust there, and, and it's a, it, it and it they, it sh they should be a distrust there, especially when you find out that there's members of your police force in different towns that are that are members of some of these alt-right groups. I mean, how, how, how have we gotten to this? I feel like that's an interesting point, as you're saying that, I know the original question posed was on how do we get the lid back in Pandora's box to stop some of this outward, um, white privilege and white supremacy. And I think that if we're having these people who are in power, like police officers and our politicians, that are upholding and expressing these values, that that's what's making it okay or posing that it should be okay for other people to express these beliefs. It's not so much as these beliefs are new in society, it's just that now we're seeing places where, safe spaces where they're allowed to be expressed. 
along with that fact uh, that they are given a safe place to say these things. They've been shown time and time again through politicians in places, and they say, you know, things that are very discriminatory and can be labeled as racist. They are seen saying these things, and they receive no repercussions. This has given people in different areas, in different communities, um, a reassurance that no matter what they do, no matter what they say, there's not going to be any repercussion. That also has to do with the many police shootings that we've seen. It's only in the past few years that we've really seen any change when it comes to repercussions when there's killings of an unarmed black man or the killing of an unarmed black child. Almost no account. So whiteness as a cultural category has changed quite a bit in the last century. And demography is a really powerful force in the United States in terms of, I think, uh, the prevalence of white supremacy. So as white people become a smaller and smaller portion of the population, one of the ideas here is that it is, uh, these sentiments are becoming more visible because of that anxiety of being put in a minority position. So in that case, does what being white, does it expand to other groups? Do other groups begin to be incorporated into categories of whiteness so that white supremacy can continue to be maintained? So in that sense, might we expect this kind of implicit bias to expand to other groups of people who are right now not considered white or black? That's a really interesting question. I heard um, a while back, so I'll try to remember, remember it accurately, a, a radio program where two uh, Latinx women were being interviewed about racism and racial bias or whatever. And one of them was a real activist for Latinx women and the Black Lives Matter movement. The other one said that she was hesitant at this point in her life to be such an activist because she was reflecting on how much she had benefited from the higher the, the, the colorism white privilege scale and she she seemed my sense that the other woman was like well you could still be a part of our activism and her she she must have she had some sense of well maybe I, I, I can't be a legitimate activist because I I'm like I'm a light-skinned Latina I just thought that was interesting that she was wrestling with that, um, but the other woman was saying it, it, it doesn't matter, get over that, that guilt to become active, be an activist with us. Yes? Um, in my experience with um, people using the group membership as like their drawback of why they don't support people, so I've had many white peers who didn't seem to want to outright support you know, Black Lives Matter or outright support, you know, different um, issues that are towards POC um, communities. And they would go back to their group membership and just, you know, support that overall overarching thing. And when we go into like these group sessions about like reconciliation and these common goals that we need to have, a lot of times it's, about, it's still white-centered. So we try to incorporate POCs in these communities, but they're still white-centered, they're still white-oriented, they're still white-founded and white-established. But bringing more POCs isn't going to make the issue less, like, less um, prominent. I feel like by drawing in more POCs, it's still emphasizing that overarching thing that white people are still at the top or still at the forefront of those issues. I think that's a, a, a really um, good point, particularly at a predominantly white institution like Mill Sachs, um, in a predominantly black city like Jackson, um, in a state that has the highest percentage of black people in the nation. And my thought is that because of the amount of power that white people have in our nation still, that white people need to come 
to a point maybe where they pressure each other about, about goodness and, and fairness and be hopefully willing to sort of vote in a way that is more fair and to see what is more fair or to enact and help along policy that is fair. Um, I don't see how the situa a situation can really change unless you have people in power adjusting um, their goals together. And sadly, it seems like with our Supreme Court right now, the crowning achievement of the civil rights movement, of which we had tremendous development in our state, has been um, hugely compromised since 2013 with the Shelby versus Shelby County versus Holder Supreme Court case. And then again in 2018, even further, with the Supreme Court case um, Abbott versus Ms. Perez. Um, so we're not going in the right direction as, as I see it. We need to go in the other, we need to dial back um, anti-racist policy, but it seems we're dialing, we're dialing racist policy up. Um, I've always thought it was interesting, uh, speaking to your point, um, that the activist uh, movement when it comes to race is led primarily by black people in a lot of cases, not necessarily all the time. But when you look at the problem of racism and white privilege, it's up to white people to change white privilege. It's, it's up to white people, um, I think, in a large sense, to come to the realization um, that our privilege doesn't really help everyone. Racism doesn't help everyone. So um, it's interesting to me that we don't have white activists, big, large groups of white activists who um, are, are you know, fighting to, for equity and for equality and to end racism. Um, and I, I do think it's very much about a power um, issue and an accountability issue. Um, so, I mean, on a campus like Millsaps, for us to care, as white people, to care enough to come together as a white group to fight against racism and white power and white privilege, uh, so that all of us can be more equal um, and have the quality of life on our campus and in our community. Um, I don't know if that's possible. Um, yeah, right. I mean, so much hinges on giving up comforts. Right. Uh, it's like, what do you want to do to, yes. So earlier in your presentation, you mentioned, you know, the idea of structural um, racism and all of this. And I was just wondering maybe where you saw that and how you feel like structures can become or begin to be dismantled. Because I think ultimately we can, we can have conversations about people being kind and being nice to each other, but until the structural pieces are addressed, we're never really going to see the change that we're, we're talking about. So, I mean, you mentioned the Supreme Court, you know, situation that's going on right now, and I just found it very, you know, not shocking, but interesting to see how um, the candidate for the Supreme Court, uh, Katanji Brown Jackson, was treated throughout the process of her interviews versus the way previous uh, candidates for those positions have been um, have been viewed. And I just wonder what your thoughts are were on the larger structural pieces. Because I mean, when you talk about structures, you're talking about laws, policies, access to education, and you know, access to job opportunities. Those are larger structural ideas that then trickle down and impact some of these issues, like some of the things that are being brought up here today. So I just wonder what your opinions were, or based on your research, what you've seen in terms of structural racism. Yeah, well, I think that the most important thing is adjusting the structures, like you're saying. And um, unfortunately, with Katanji Brown Jackson's hearing, 
what we saw are, were representatives and senators more interested in advancing their own reputations in order to maintain power and to score points with their constituents than tapping into what her abilities are. Um, and that, that, that relates to the recent Supreme Court, not only appointees, but decisions that the Supreme Court cases that I mentioned, Shelby, Shelby County versus Holder and um, Abbott versus Perez, they're both um, cases regarding the voting uh, voter suppression. And um, the most recent one I think is even more troubling, the one, um, the one about Texas Jerry, uh, race, uh, racial gerrymandering, which is the one that is Abbott versus Perez, because in it, the majority, the Supreme Court majority basically says, I think we need to take at, in good faith, legislators who are creating redistricting, who are creating redistricting um, systems. That's, that's shocking to me, to think that in the state of our nation right now, our Supreme Court could assume that legislators are just to be trusted and be, and that they're in good faith in, in drawing uh, districts. So they over, so that case in 2018 overturned a, the previous court that had said, look, these do look heavily racially gerrymandered, these districts in, te in Texas. And therefore, that, that court decided, you have to prove that these districts are not racially gerrymandered. That was the, that court decision, which was appealed to the Supreme Court. And our Supreme Court said, no, we need to trust the intentions of our legislators. Um, you know, so that's really dialing back the, um, the, at least the potential, the, and actually some of the gains that the Voting Rights Act of 1965 had. And we, you know, if we could pass the um, John Lewis uh, Voting Rights Bill, it would do a lot to remedy that, but it's not in passing. Thank you to everyone, uh, especially Kristen, uh, for such a stimulating, challenging, uh, and enlightening talk. And, and Ryan, your last question and uh, Kristen's answer uh, leads me to reflect on the, one of the things that I brought from this, that uh, removing or mitigating personal bias is an important but secondary goal, uh, that the real goal is uh, creating a structural justice. And uh, so I'm, I'm glad to be uh, in, a, in, a, in an environment where these conversations are possible and fostered and to work with such a fantastic group of faculty members uh, that think deeply and, uh, and critically about important issues like this. I, I invite those of you who are with us live uh, to continue the conversation uh, in a reception. And David, is it across the hall? Great. We're actually able to use our reception space as a reception space for the first time in, in a couple of years. So I invite you to join us, continue the conversation, and uh, join me one more time in thinking, uh, in thanking Kristen for a, a wonderful talk and great work. Thank <laughs> you.